This is Treatment Free Beekeeping, where we talk about the steps you can take or what it's like to try to keep bees treatment free. From the beginning to hopefully a successful end, we'll go through the process as we experience it in our life on Wildflower Bee Farm. This is Treatment Free Beekeeping. Let's get started. Welcome to this week's podcast. It's May 8th, 2024. I'm Hank Sveck. This podcast is sort of going to be a thinking through process and I'm hoping you'll do it with me because of what we discovered this week and also what I learned by doing some follow-up research. So to start things off, we have two survivor hives on the farm from um, previous years going into our fourth year of treatment free and we have one hive that I brought in from a a neighboring beekeeper in a place called Dresden BLB Honey where they uh, have a hive that survived the winter and they sent me the whole list of how it was treated and it was robbed in the fall and they thought it was dead and they were so surprised in the spring that it survived and we ended up getting that hive because I want to do some research on OTS on the spot splits. So <clears throat> as you know we study, I study hundreds of hours of videos um, over the course of a season and in viewing the videos of that hive that we brought in there were amazing amounts of drones coming and going and even though I had opened the hive a week earlier and saw that there were no indications of a lot going on as far as needing to split them for swarming and so on or whatever I was going to do I was going to actually split them and use the OTS method but they didn't seem ready I thought I better go in and have a look and be prepared because with all these drones it's kind of likely that they're going to swarm so I went in and when I opened up the hive the first thing that happened is they were nasty they, <laughs> you know when you get that cloud that goes up in the air it's like they're looking you in the eye and then they just disperse all over you they hit you in the head they hit, now I was fully clothed with a bee, with a bee suit with the exception of the ankle area because I had on running shoes because I had to walk a bit to get to this hive and I thought well you know if I get stung it's good for my arthritis and sure enough I got stung in the ankle it's funny how they find those spots but they were nasty and after when I was finished they were they pretty much followed me for about 25 feet or so well very far and then they left me alone so they were clearly in a defensive mode of that hive probably not overly aggressive and I don't mind it actually I, I kind of like bees that have some spunk because I do believe it helps them survive. So when going in, I did find some uh, queen cells that had been closed off. Um, one looked like super seizure, the other one looked like a swarm hive, so a swarm uh, cell, so I thought, okay, it's very simple. I will, because they were so nasty, there's no way I'm going to take my time to try to find a queen, so I thought, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll do a shake off and then I'll put the frames above a queen excluder, wait three hours, come back and then just move the top and the bottom. And that way I know there's the queen in the bottom and the top will have a, the queen cells that they've created. Uh, plus I'll notch one hive just for fun, one, one frame just for fun. So I did that. I came back three hours later, I moved the top box that I had put on there and I put a, f a frame of um, honey and I'm fortunate I have a lot of frames of incredible honey to give back to the bees. Moved it uh, and left the queen with the base on site. Then I got back and I started thinking, what do we know about the size of the queen cells in relation to the health of the bee? So as I started doing more research, I realized that the, the queens, first of all, uh, can lay different eggs, different types of eggs, depending on the situation, which I found fascinating. And this science has been well proven. So initially, if a queen is in a situation where there's less food or where there is small quarters, where it's more confined space, she lays larger worker eggs, which are more likely to survive and be healthy than eggs that are smaller in stature that she will lay if there are a lot of bees or there are a lot of um, space, there's lots of space in the hive. The science also indicates that queens, so when the bees start creating a queen cell and make the base, 
the queen actually comes along and lays an egg in that cell. It's almost like she's planting the seed to eliminate herself if it's supersedure. And if it's swarming, she's doing that so that she can, she'll be swarming with the other bees and leave a strong queen behind. That cell, that egg that the queen puts into the queen cup is in fact a different egg than she puts into all the other worker cells. So let's think about that for a minute. The makeup of those queen cells, the egg in that queen cup that is purposely laid for supersedure or for swarming is laid directly by the queen. It's a different kind of egg. The eggs that are used under an emergency situation are in fact worker eggs and larvae that become queen cells, which are by research notice inferior to queens that are raised from eggs that were purposely laid by the queen. Let's think about that for a minute. That's crazy. <laughs> First of all, no one knows how the queen can adjust the eggs based on the environment, let alone where she's laying it. Like, does she have pouches? So if you look at that, you say to yourself, what does that mean? Well, that means that when we do what are called walkaway splits, if there are known queen, no queen cells in the um, box that we're taking or the frames that we're taking, no pre-made queen cells by the hive naturally, the bees are going to make an emergency queen, which is going to be inferior to a queen that has been made purposely by the queen and hive. So automatically we're in trouble. And it may only be 10 to 15% of the variance in quality. So we're not talking a crazy amount, but remember, everything's in balance. And if we start tweaking things a little bit or a great deal, we're going to cause problems. So then think about this. The research and the science shows that when you graft queens, when you take larvae with your brush or eggs and move them to a artificial queen cell, and the bees then do their thing. It's no different than doing the emergency queen. These are all emergency queens. Same with the OTS method, when we notch. And I'm, I'm sounding like a veteran, but I have no clue. I've only done it once, so I have no idea. But the, but the theory is the same. You encourage bees to create queen cells out of worker egg and larvae. Now, they say multi-generationally, if that's how queens are raised, they're, they're become more and more inferior. So when we think of the bees that we get that are considered to be purebred, like I, I think I indicated I have two Russian queens coming, they would have been artificially created. Now, the hope is that the uh, artificially created queens will, in fact, uh, lay eggs into purposely built queen cups which will improve their quality over time if we start that process but we don't really know so my question really has to do with why are we now that we know this information now now before we go there some people will say well how do you know that the worker bees aren't simply moving a worker meant egg into a queen cup to create the queen which means you're still getting inferior genetics or a poor quality egg and the answer is the research shows bees don't move eggs for that reason they may move them out of a hive uh, there's some research on them consuming if there are too many which is another fancy way of saying they'll eat them or if a worker is laying eggs they of course will remove them or dispose of them in another way so we don't really know that so here's the thing what does this tell us? Well, if we backtrack a bit, the video analysis of drones was helpful in you know, getting me to open this hive and have a look because if I waited the two weeks, which I was supposed to, they would have swarmed and it would have been too late to figure this out and to create you know, what I need to do. So when I did the split yesterday, I took the frames that had the queen cups and moved them to the new split hive. And so in a week, I'll go in and see if they've hatched out or if the um, uh, 
the notching produced anything. But remember, the notching will be inferior queens, and so then the question will be, well, what will the bees do about that? Uh, traditionally, if the queen does hatch from the um, hive-created cups, she will go and kill, or the bees will actually destroy the other cups. So hopefully that will happen if it, if it does work out. But think of the implications to our practice of what we do. So whether it's grafting, walk-away splits, any type of splits, or the OTS method, we're actually raising inferior queens according to this science. The other implication is to the size of the hives. Two years ago, all of the hives that we kept in isolated five-frame boxes survived but one. I think I had like 10 survivor hives. They were either five frames or five frame with a five frame above, and that was it. They were in the middle of the farm. There were no other extra warming situations or anything. It was a very small inner cover where I put some. At that time, it was um, a wood shavings. Now it's a bit of uh, wool uh, from sheep. So, so the size of the hive matters. The bigger the hive, the poorer quality eggs are going to be laid by the queen, according to the science. So you're going to want to keep, I, I'm, I'm going to want to keep bees in hives that are single. That would be the largest probably would be a single deep. Now here's an interesting idea, and I've ordered some queen cups to see if this would work. What happens when you put in um, empty queen cups, the artificial kind, in a hive? Will the queen lay eggs in that, in those cups? Will the bees then, you know, nurture and take care? And then will you then be able to get better quality queens by letting the queens do the work as opposed to this grafting method. So what I'm going to do is try a few. Simply put some frames in different hives that I have here with empty queen cups and see what happens. And then follow them and see, um, does that make any difference? Will they survive and so on? Who knows? Now there's some argument, if you look at the research, well, if there's an empty queen cup, you know, a worker may put something in there or, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say what will end up being in those queen cups. I did find a Russian researcher who did this work many years ago. And in his analogy, he said that the workers were actually carrying eggs in, but he hadn't seen that or witnessed it. He just assumed that was the case. But now we do know that queens lay eggs purposely in queen cups that are of a higher and different quality and makeup than the eggs they lay in worker cells. That alone should make us all start spinning and thinking. <laughs> I don't know what that means. And even if the variance is 10% or less, it's still a percentage variance of success, which we need to think about when we look at survivability of hive. Now, when you, when you look at what happens with this method, it makes sense because if we do walk away splits every year, and then they swarm in July, or we do it in July, certainly we're going to have queens that are going to last a few months, last through winter, but then the process has to continue again because they're inferior to those queens that are raised from queens at the outset. They didn't start as worker larvae or worker um, eggs. They started as queen-egg-larvae combo. So this is Hank for treatment-free beekeeping at the Wildflower Bee Farm. My question is, will this change things? I think it's a game changer. I'm going to do the uh, study. I'm going to start it on Monday. I've ordered the um, plastic cups, and I'm going to fool around with how to install them on different frames and move some things around and see if it makes a difference. And I'll keep you posted. It's kind of a fun project. I'm also looking to do the trial. I'll still do some OTS, but I think what I'm really going to focus on is trying to use the video analysis to to better predict when to open up a hive when there may be queen cells created by the hive. Now, that's a bit risky. So I started thinking about, well, what happens when they swarm? Now, think about this. Swarms generally, 70% of swarms don't make it. And I have a feeling what happens. If a swarm splits off and they're strong enough, and it's early enough in the season, they would supersede that queen before the winter comes. That's probably their only hope of survival. I don't know if a queen, original queen that swarms, if she stays alive, will actually be able to get through the winter in a strong way and survive to the spring 
to let that hive take off. I think the 30% that survive with swarms, whether it's nature or on our own farm, has to do with bees that supersede the swarm queen. Now, it could also be that more than one queen goes, which is not unusual, apparently, from what I read. Uh, but it's doubtful they would then go to the same hive. I don't know the answer to that. So there's a, so so part of the excitement, I think, if I do get any swarms, and I'm not sure there'll be any, but if any swarms choose to live in any of our empty hives that I've put out there as bait hives, what I'm going to do is very quickly when I find that out is put a medium or even a deep full of honey on top so that they don't have to worry about you know, building comb and all that with resources. They're going to have a lot of resources. And the question, will that encourage them then to do supersedure cells in July um, so that they have a strong new queen to take into the winter? Lots to think about. So this is Hank for treatment-free beekeeping at the Wildflower Bee Farm. Have an amazing week, and we'll talk soon. To learn more about our project, make sure you go to wildflowerbeefarm.com. There you can find further information on the latest research articles we've put out, find out where you can pick up some t-shirts, and all the other interesting things we're doing on the farm. That's wildflowerbeefarm.com.